Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of the pearls for ethmoid and sphenoid surgery, and then we'll uh, go over them in the lab again as well as mentioned. Uh, I'm going to also try to highlight some of the key vascular anatomy that we want to try to avoid. I know we've talked a little bit about some of the arteries that we want to try to avoid when we're doing ethmoid surgery. And I'll also talk about some pearls uh, through case examples if we get a moment. So first to start with uh, the ethmoid. Um, as we all know, the ethmoid bone is a very complex bone. It's helpful to remember that the middle turbinate, and the uncinate, the lamina, all of that is actually part of the ethmoid bone. We don't do a lot uh, intracranially, obviously, uh, with this course, but the cristigalli, which extends up into the intracranial cavity, also is part of the ethmoid bone, as, of course, is the cribriform plate, which you have to be able to recognize both endonasally and on your CT scan to try to avoid. Uh, this is the lamina papyracea, and again, as I mentioned, middle turbinate and the uncinate process are also part of the bone. One other point I'll make that I think is a really uh, an important nuance of the anatomy is that the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate fuse together on the, uh, as far as the bone or lamella of those two structures, and then together that fusion plane attaches to the cribriform plate. So I'm going to show you the significance of that uh, in the lab. But that fusion point you can actually see because there's a cleft, a very conserved landmark between the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate, and you can use that fusion plane to identify the superior turbinate by flexing the middle turbinate out of your way. A lot of words, but when you see it once in the lab, you'll see how it can be a powerful way of actually finding the sphenoid sinus. Um, long ago, uh, Bill Bolger talked about uh, operating in a matchbox-like space when doing an ethmoidectomy. The boundaries here would be the lamina laterally, the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, lamella medially, skull base, of course, up top, and then inferiorly, it would open into the middle meatus. So it's nice to remind yourself that that's kind of the space we have to work with, size of about a matchbox. So you want to be very careful and meticulous with your technique. We've talked already about the skull base, and I totally agree. You want to really look for asymmetries. Uh, this classification really talks about the depth of the surgery. And one other way to think about it is, as you're operating in that matchbox, if the roof is hanging lower than you expect, it's kind of in your field or in your face. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about these different classification systems. Uh, we're not going to go through every named cell, but appreciate there are many that you have to encounter and manage, both in the anterior ethmoid space and also in the posterior ethmoid. Um, we're trying to get away from calling things like Haller cells and Onodi cells, uh, but appreciate that they are very important to recognize because there are consequences if you don't recognize them. In 2016, as this sh uh, slide shows, we kind of started uh, changing the nomenclature that we use for cells in the frontoethmoid region. Now we think of them as stacked posterior cells and stacked ethmoid cells. This is a, a very surgeon-friendly anatomic orientation, I think. It's not you know, type one cell, type two. The, the nomenclature is actually the words that we would use to describe the cell. A lot of this uh, staging system is really centered around the ethmoid bulla as the kind of dominant, let's say, conserved landmark in the posterior stack of cells. And then anteriorly, a lot of the nomenclature you can see has to do with the agronazi cell. So I'll just highlight those two. Appreciate what we're talking about is once you identify the bulla and the agronazi, those core uh, landmarks of the frontal recess, these are all just cells that are stacked above them, either behind you or behind the frontal recess drainage or in front. And of course, we would go where the yellow line is between those two anterior and posteriorly stacked cells. So let's talk a little bit about the ethmoid bulla. This is uh, one of the more conserved landmarks, of course, in the middle meatus. Appreciate you can have space above the bulla and even behind the bulla, bulla by way of a retrobullar space. Um, <clears throat> this really shows you the layers that you go through in starting the ethmoidectomy. We had a great lecture on taking the uncinate down. The next thing you're going to bump into is, of course, the ethmoid bulla, because you've gone through the hiatus semilunaris to move that uncinate out of the way. Also notice that the ethmoid bulla always has space medially. And that's because, of course, this is a cell not against the orbit. It is on the orbit. It's part of the orbit. The lateral aspect of the ethmoid bulla is the lamina papyracea. So when you go to take the cell down, it would be wiser to attack it medially and inferiorly. Inferiorly so you get the whole thing out. Medially so you're as far away from that critical structure of the orbit as possible. And I'll show you a quick video on how I like to do that. Many different techniques and many different uh, types of instruments that you can use from Tourette's all the way to microdebeaters. And speaking of the lamina, I really liked yesterday how 
Dr. Adapa talked about the layers of a skull base injury, and I think it's helpful to remember them in the scenario of orbital injury as well. So before you enter the orbit, before you see any orbital fat, you will have had to traverse, one, the mucosa, two, the lamina, and then three, the periorbita. Initially, the same analogous three layers that Nithin talked about, right, where the periorbita is the dura. That's important to recognize because if you take down the lamina papyracea, you should not see any orbital fat, none. You can blot the eye all you want, you're not gonna see any fat. Because that housing periorbita, that investing fascia, is very dense, and you actually have to traverse that before you see fat. What do you do if you see fat? You assess the level of injury, right? We saw that horrible microdometer injury that uh, Stacy showed, that's a different scenario. If it's just a little bit of fat, we just kind of leave it alone. You know, if it's bleeding in your face, we, you can take a bipolar to cauterize it. Most often, you don't have to do anything. You just try to avoid manipulating it, try to avoid suctioning it. And if you're comfortable and it's a very small injury, we would just proceed and finish our procedure. Uh, an MRI can be helpful to really delineate that. You can imagine how complicated this case would be, right? Because that outpouching of orbital contents and fat is going to look like either a polyp or just mucosa. So using navigation to completely avoid that area, maybe going behind it, above it, below it, and almost identifying it and dissecting it out would be a nice play to avoid any further injury. So let's pivot a little bit to the sphenoid sinus. This is a really cool view of the sphenoid bone, one of the more complex bones of the body. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key anatomic relations. Uh, we use a lot of this for skull-based surgery, but I think the knowledge is gonna be helpful. Uh, the sphenoid sinus has plates, as you can see here, the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. There's kind of a body of the pterygoid or a pterygoid wedge. And then there's these uh, four foramina that come out of the sphenoid sinus. Okay, relevant because if you start doing the big hole surgery we talked about yesterday, you will encounter some of this. Now you won't encounter the yellow, which is the foramen rotundum, where V2 comes through into the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, but you would and may encounter the vidian, uh, uh, the, uh, vidian canal, which is in purple. Uh, if you sort of dissect out these little planes that I'm showing, orthogonal planes, using those two landmarks, you can see how we could access the PPF below, the nasopharynx, infratemporal fossa in the lower aspect, and then higher up, you can actually get to the uh, cavernous sinus and the uh, middle cranial fossa as well. Interestingly, these are very recognizable landmarks on all CTs, and it's really kind of fun to look at some of these things. Uh, we don't often talk beyond the foramen rotundum and vidian canal, and you may not know, but on an axial scan, you can very often even see the vidian canal. You see it there. It's a funnel shape. And on axial canal, you can see it also, uh, axial view, you can see how it goes to the genu of the carotid artery, the horizontal to the, uh, uh, the uh, vertical part of the carotid. So just interesting anatomy that we probably saw a lot, but uh, just maybe didn't make the connection that you can actually uh, see some of these key structures. When we talk about the sphenoid, we mentioned the, I mentioned the onodi cell before. Again, we call that the sphenoethmoid, most posterior sphenoethmoid cell. The way to recognize whether you have an onodi or not is often you'll see this cruciate sign. So on a coronal view, this is a very dramatic one because you can see these are actually the optic nerves kind of floating in the breeze here. But appreciate there's sort of a cross in the middle of the sphenoid. When you see that cross, usually what that can mean is that the upper two cells are the sphenoethmoid cells and you can confirm that on a sagittal view. Here you see the onodi going well above the natural sphenoid sinus, which is below us there. And you want to be able to recognize this because, of course, the consequence is you may have an optic nerve injury. It's been said 80% of optic nerve injuries happen in an unrecognized onodi cell. The thought is, if you're in the sphenoid, you know it's tiger country laterally, optic nerve carotid, but you're not going to think of the optic nerve and sometimes even the carotid artery in a posterior ethmoid cell, right? You're gonna be looking for lamina and you'll be uh, lulled into thinking uh, you're in a safe zone when you may not be. Uh, so as far as uh, other things you wanna look at, the degree of pneumatization, <clears throat> septations, as was mentioned earlier yesterday, a lot of those septations will go to the carotid canal. Significance, if you go and torque on it, you could puncture the canal. So we take those down sharply. You can take them down all the way flush to the canal, but you would use a drill or some sharp instrument so you don't have that torquing, uh, generate any torque so you don't puncture things. You have to know where the carotid artery is, of course, if you're doing uh, much in the sphenoid sinus. And sometimes we're really helped along the way by seeing our anatomy through a, uh, a well-pneumatized sinus. So this is looking in the lateral wall of a very well-pneumatized sphenoid. You see the optic nerve there. We call that the OCR, that's pneumatization into the anterior clinide process. 
that little cavity between the optic nerve and the uh, ICA below it. So uh, what are some of the keys to sphenoid sinus surgery? Recognizing when you have that Onodi cell, in other words, making sure you're actually in the sphenoid when you think you're in the sphenoid. Uh, the superior turbinate is the dominant landmark for finding the sphenoid sinus. If you find the su uh, superior turbinate, it should be very easy to find the uh, sphenoid sinus because that os is always medial to the superior turbinate in the sphenoethmoid recess. That's that little slit between the septum and the medial aspect of the superior turbinate, and the sphenoid sinus is looking at us on FOSS whenever we have that transnasal view. A couple other points that we alluded to a little bit yesterday, the os is usually housed in the upper half of the sphenoid sinus face. So appreciate when you enter, you're kind of closer to the roof than you are the floor. And there's that little posterior branch of the sphenopalatine artery, the posterior septal branch, which you may encounter if you continue to take that sphenoid os inferiorly towards the floor of it. So here's that view that we're all very familiar with. You can see if you move that super, middle turbinate out of the way, you're going to see that little cleft, okay, between <laughs> superior turbinate and middle turbinate. And when we come the other way, to do an ethmoidectomy, transethmoid approach to the sphenoid sinus, I'd argue you want to find that little cleft as you open the basal lamella, and the superior terminate will be waiting for you there in a pristine and very recognizable uh, position. Quick uh, note on uh, the vasculature. I know we've talked a lot about the uh, anterior ethmoid artery, which you can see uh, here in this picture. Uh, remember, it can be below the skull base. This is about a one-third pattern where it's actually in our field. And it's helpful to remember and to find that anterior ethmoid artery on every scan. If you look at that navigation image and the coronal view, the last cut of the globe at the confluence of the superior oblique and medial rectus muscles. The artery actually courses between those muscles. And that's helpful to remember as well, because if you injure it, it's not an intracranial bleed we're going to get. It's an intraorbital or retrobulbar hematoma that you're at risk for, because the blood flow is coming from the eye into the ethmoid or into the brain cavity. Uh, the posterior ethmoid, we don't uh, talk about too much. It's usually a, a much smaller vessel that you can easily cauterize. And usually, we're not doing too much work uh, in that posterior space. But it's in the skull base, usually, at the level of the sphenoid face. So if you take your sphenoid too high, or you're doing a lot of digging on that last little aspect of the face meeting the skull base, you could encounter that artery. OK, the sphenopalatine artery. Here's a, a quick view of the osteology. Looking in the sphenopalatine foramen, when you look laterally with this 30 degree scope, you see that foramen rotundum. You see that vidian canal that I mentioned kind of emptying into the PPF. This is the right side. We're doing a sphenopalatine artery ligation. A couple things to notice here. One, we're raising a small flap about a centimeter or so anterior to the lateral attachment of the middle turbinate. That's a key landmark. And you're going to see uh, a bony protuberance called the crista ethmoidalis that comes off the palatine bone, which points the way to the sphenopalatine artery. And if you are doing this for epistaxis, you can kind of dissect that out. We usually do open up the back wall of the maxillary sinus to make sure there aren't too many uh, other branches that the artery is actually bri or trifurcated before it comes out of the sphenopalatine foramen. The other thing to notice, look in the maxillary sinus. You can actually see kind of a bleb of the artery in the back wall. And if you look for that, you'll see it often. That's helpful because it kind of helps you align the level that you're going to encounter the artery at as you're raising that little flap. This is a very straightforward type of procedure that I think anyone in the room will be very readily able to do as long as you've practiced it and just seen that uh, anatomy once or twice. You can clip it a few times, and then I don't even divide it. I just put a little surgicel, put the flap back uh, for epistaxis care, and that's all we would do. So I'm going to show one uh, quick case just to highlight uh, some of these things. Now, this is the same uh, scan that you saw before where there's a very large Onodi cell. We're looking on the left side. I'm taking down the bull ethmoidalis starting medially. You can use a shaver like a curette by opening the blade and just curetting forward. We use that height of the maxillary sinus that was mentioned earlier. Totally agree, but you want to come a little bit anterior to the actual flat part of the basal lamella so that you fall into that cleft space that I talked about earlier. That's a superior turbinate you're seeing just in the uh, depth of things. Obviously, this is a polyp case, so we're going to take a, uh, a lot of that superior turbinate out. Again, I like to do a lot of my surgery with a microderbeater and then sharp instrumentation when things are attached to the skull base or I have formidable bone that I'm managing. This is a sphenoid sinus we're opening and entering here, but look at this, the Onodi, optic nerve, carotid artery, straight ahead. 
So if you didn't realize that that was an Onodi cell, here not only could you injure the optic nerve, you could get a carotid artery injury because it's so well pneumatized. Um, we had a nice view of how you can take down some of those bony partitions. Again, I do like using powered instrument. I th just think it's efficient and expeditious. Uh, you can kind of go float across the lamina and use a little bit of forward backward movement and take down some of those partitions. And of course, handheld instruments are fantastic for this as well. Um, we can talk more in the lab about this, but I like doing the lower sinuses first. So while I will retroflex and take down the uncinate, I don't switch to a 30 degree scope at that juncture. I get a little bit of a reservoir for my maxillary sinus and I keep going so that I don't have to go zero to 30, back to zero, back to 30 for the frontal. So I do a little bit of a maxillary sinus opening, take down the bulla, basal lamella, do the ethmoidectomy and sphenoid. Then I switch out, there's a you know, hard pause. You might put some pledges in there, go to a 30 degree scope, switch to my curve suction, curve probes and so on and we can demonstrate some in the lab. So as you all know, successful surgery is based on that understanding of that very nuanced anatomy that we talked about. And I think looking for all the landmarks we talked about uh, on CT before every case uh, is really gonna uh, assure you have good outcomes. Thank you.